light the first candle to honor Lakota spirituality. When one sits in the hoop of the people, we must be responsible because all of creation is related. And the hunt of one and the hurt of one is the hurt of all. And the honor of one is the honor of all. And whatever we do affects everything in the universe. We light the second candle to honor Buddhism because all existence is founded upon the ever-present state of union. Everything already exists in a state of tranquility. However, this state of tranquility is masked from all of us by our assumption that there is separation, that there is a problem. We light the third candle to honor Sikhism. Even as the scent dwells within the flower, so God resides within your heart. We light the fourth candle to honor Islam, our bread, and water are of one table. The prodigy of Adam are as a single soul. We light the fifth candle to honor Judaism. Actually, we are all divine light. We sparkle, we glow. But when fear arrives, it, like water on fire, quenches our heart's warmth. We light the sixth candle to honor Hinduism. When we are afraid of someone or something, it is because we do not feel that particular person or thing is a part of us. When we have established conscious oneness with the absolute, with the infinite vast, then everything there is is a part of us. And how can we be afraid of ourselves? We light the final candle to honor Christianity. Your life and my life flow into each other as wave flows into wave. And unless there is peace and joy and freedom for you, there can be no real peace or joy or freedom for me. Today's reading is by Harry Palmer. When you adopt the view that there is nothing that exists that is not a part of you, that there is no one who exists who is not a part of you, that any judgment you make is self-judgment, that any criticism you level is self-criticism. You will extend to yourself an unconditional love that will be the light of the world. And if you could, if you could please go into the silence with me for a moment. I give thanks, and I recognize that we are so blessed that we are the oneness, that we are the consciousness. We are the one consciousness of all that is, infinite and always. I'm knowing that this servant service is blessed, that this time that we are together is blessed, that we are fed with such love and such healing and such wisdom. I'm knowing that everyone who participates in this service is blessed. I know that our children are blessed. I give thanks to the Higher Mind Band and I give thanks to Reverend Cece and I know that the words of love, the words of the infinite wisdom of God are the words that come through her. And I say thank you.
And so be it. So I'm, I apologize, I didn't change the reading. That was actually uh, last week's topic. As you'll remember, we talked about the mirror of life. Um, what I wanted to do today is to kind of wrap up this concept that we've been talking about all month of unity, of oneness with all that is, um, and talk a little bit about what happens when we become a conscious and, and continuously aware of that unity. There's a, an enormous spiritual power that comes from that realization. And, and I also want to talk about the practices that help us realize that. Excuse me. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, wrote this. He said, the secret of spiritual power is a consciousness of one's union with the whole and of the availability of good. We are one with the universal creativeness, which is the god of theology, the spirit of mysticism, the reality of philosophy, and the principle of science. Those were the things that he kind of studied and, and thought about as, as all coming together in, to, in a single point. Theology, mysticism, philosophy, and science. And, and the, the thing that all points to is that there is this one whole and that we're always one with it. We can't not be. It's our awareness of oneness that gets lost by the wayside sometimes. When, when we remember and understand this unity, this oneness with everything, then we start to live from the consciousness of union. And that is an immensely powerful and immensely peaceful place to live from. You know, when I remember that I am one with the divine, then, then what happens is I remember that what I really am cannot be hurt or harmed or damaged or destroyed ever. And that is a very powerful place to be because when we can let go of the fears that keep us stuck in life physically or emotionally, we free up an en enormous amount of energy. We spend so much time being afraid of what what might, what might happen to us. There are so many things in my life that I haven't done because I was afraid I'd like break my finger or something, you know. I haven't gone skydiving because I'm scared. But, but more than that, we're afraid of what other people will think. We're afraid we're going to be judged. We're afraid we're going to look silly. We're afraid, we're afraid, we're afraid. We might be mocked or ridiculed. We might look strange or out of place. And so we don't do things. We allow those fears to stop us from doing our life's work here. But when we know our unity with all that is, when we remember that we're kind of plugged into this great ocean of life, that fear sort of drops away. Because what does it really matter if some person I've never met thinks I look silly when I am riding those waves of life itself and doing what I'm called to do by my own inner self, right? The other thing is when we're aware of our oneness, we know we're always plugged in. We're always plugged into that source of life, the universe, the isness and the enoughness of spirit, which is the basis of real prosperity and real security in life. And we understand that this thing called life is eternal because it, the, the life of the one, the life of the universe just keeps going and so we can get a little little bit of room from that fear of death that seems to plague us all and, and we replace that with the courage to live when we're consciously aware of our oneness with everything and the way we become consciously aware is by practicing Right? Like we say about everything. You've got to practice it in order to make it yours. And the practices that we teach here are, are all aimed at giving us a greater sense of that deep, deep spiritual truth that we can't be separate from this one ever. And we sometimes say, God is all there is and all there is is God. And we say that, but do we understand what it really means? That means that I am 
one with it, and you are one with it, and you and you and you and everything. So that truly, as the, as the Sufis say, wherever we look, we see the face of God, because it's all that one, right? <coughs> And as Jesus said, whither, or the Psalms, excuse me, the Psalms said, Where, whither can I go from thy spirit? There is no place it's not. That's what we're trying to arrive at. Because when we do, we know ourselves as we truly are. There's a, a little book called The Tao of Leadership by John Hyder. It was a, one of the assigned books in ministerial school. and It's a really good book, but he says in it, it's, his, it's wisdom for leaders, which we all are. To know how other people behave takes intelligence, but to know myself takes wisdom. To manage other people's lives takes strength, but to manage my own life takes true power. If I am content with what I have, I can live simply and enjoy both prosperity and free time. If my goals are clear, I can achieve them without fuss. If I am at peace with myself, I do not spend my life force in conflict. If I have learned to let go, I do not need to fear, fear dying. It's that kind of freedom, I think, that we're really all looking for. We may think, because we've been taught, that it's, you know, we, we become free the more stuff we have or the more money we have. But I'll tell you what, I know a lot of people who have a lot of stuff and they are not free. It's that kind of wisdom and power and sense of ease in life that we're looking for. The freedom to act not on the urgings of our fears, but on the urgings of our inner self. The urging that is urging us to bloom into all that we came here to be. It's the freedom to live a truly moral life. Not because someone's trying to make us feel guilty or tell us that we're wrong, but because that's who we are. You know, we see the divine everywhere and we act that way. That's what I consider to be a truly moral life. In this philosophy, morality is based not upon anything external, but on an, an alignment with our own nature, which is divinity and the nature of others, a respect for the divinity of others. It begins with the intention of serving the highest good. And our founder, Ernest Holmes, taught that we can do and be and have whatever we want, provided it does not take away from anyone else's ability to have and do and be what they want. That's everybody's highest good, right? If we're all taking into account each other and doing what we wish to do so long as it doesn't impinge on anybody else. That'd be a pretty cool world if everyone lived that way. You know, when we're free of that fear, then we're free to live our highest good from our highest sense of what is good and from our highest way of being in the world. And we can be courageous and we can be bold because we're not afraid of looking silly, right? Sometimes you have to be silly, you have to look silly to the rest of the world to get things done. I mean, people thought that, that Muhammad, Mahatma Gandhi was nuts when he was, you know, doing the march to the salt um, factory. And he said to his people, if they beat you, don't resist, you know, don't fight back. People thought he was crazy. He was a really bold, courageous thing to do, and it worked. And, and when Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about the same thing, you know, uh, uh, peaceful resistance non-violent resistance. People thought it was nuts, but it's the thing that worked, and he was bold enough to stand for it. That's that kind of freedom to be whatever it is our spirits and our souls and our inner self tells us to be, to speak the truth, to have a life we really want to live, to help others to shape the life they really want to live, to have the freedom to be creative, to try new things, to be more expressive, that's what the free, That's the freedom we all seek. And so recently our mothership in Denver, <laughs> Centers for Spiritual Living, our global organization, sort of realigned and revitalized our spiritual practices to make, to be more clear 
about what it is they're aimed at. And so I just want to run through those, you know, those spiritual practices again to remind us of what they are because the spiritual practices we teach are the keys to freedom. You don't just get it by wanting it, you get it by practicing. And what our founder Ernest Holmes did was to distill from the mystics and the scientists and the philosophers this, this set of truths that, that led him to then say, these are the ways you get there. These are the practices that universally show up that lead us to freedom. And I've, I've printed copies. It's one sheet front and back, and there's some by the door back there, and there's some over on the Welcome Center of this new iteration of our practices, um, which form the basis of everything we teach and everything we do, and, and um, of that rich and deep free spiritual life we're all aiming for. And so I invite you to take one and look them over. It's not that you have to do every one. It's that there's a, a lot of them in order that you can find the spiritual practice that suits you best. And the first practice, of course, is affirmative prayer, which we call spiritual mind treatment because we are treating our, our minds to a new idea about something. That's the way Ernest Holmes thought about it. We, we recognize this allness that's everywhere present and we remind ourselves we're one with it. Which is a good thing to do a lot because we forget it, right? And then we affirm the spiritual truth of what's happening and remind ourselves once again that there is nothing separating us from each other or from the universe. There's nothing separating our, us from life. And it is a very powerful way to change our thinking in the moment when we're looking at a circumstance and thinking about the fear and the icky and the, oh my God, this isn't working. And the, it's a way to change our thought process in the moment. And of course, meditation. Meditation is a bedrock for every spiritual tradition. Meditation of some sort, which is simply opening up to what's inside rather than what's coming in from the outside. And opening up to seeing also the thousands of weird little things our minds do. It's another great thing meditation does. You know, it shows us this thought stream that's always flowing through our minds. And 95% of it is, I'm not even sure we'd want to tell anybody else we were thinking it, right? <laughs> It's just nonsense, most of it. And, and it just flows through. It comes in and it flows through and we don't grab onto it. But every once in a while we grab onto a thought and we believe that it's true and we start to think it over and over and over again and it gets more and more space in our minds and then we start to live as though it's true. Now depending on the thought, that can be really good or not so good, right? depending on what the thought is. And meditation helps us simply see that the thought arises and goes away. If we don't grab it and, and you know, sink our teeth into it, it arises and goes away. It arises and goes away. And pretty soon we start to see that there's a space in there where we can say, you know, this thought's not good for me. I'm going to think something different here. And when we do that, we can put ourselves in more of a, an alignment with that ease and peace and freedom that we want. And, um, and it, that opens us up to a whole new way of being, I think. When we find the spaces where our choice lies. And mindfulness keeps us in the present moment and lets us see these you know, if we're paying attention to, to our own minds moment by moment, we see that these thoughts arise and go away, and arise and go away unless we grab onto them. And it helps us see what it is we want to grab onto. And it also lets us be present with each other in a place of love instead of, you know, being, being there but thinking about what you need to say or do next. You're really present with whoever you're with. And it teaches us to focus our attention. Which when we're trying to focus on the good in life is a very helpful skill to have. 
and we vision to seek inner guidance. It's another one of our practices to open to what is trying to happen through us. <coughs> Most of the time we're so busy taking care of, you know, our to-do list, we don't simply stop and pause and listen to what's deep within us that is trying to make itself known so that we can see what the highest good for ourselves might be or our project or our community or our world. Our leadership years ago came up through visioning with that statement, we see a world that works for everyone as our highest vision because we believe that's really what's trying to happen here and, and we want to be part of making that so. And so visioning is a way of cultivating that intuitive voice that says, you know, this is the highest and best for you and for your world. And there's a whole group of practices that are all about self-awareness. Meditation is one, but simple silence is another. Taking the time and the space to just be aware of our own consciousness. There is within us, you know, something that kind of watches all this other stuff go by. And that something, that witness self, is who we truly are. And we only find that in sort of silent openness. And gratitude is a way we realize that we're surrounded with that divine flow all the time. You know, our, we have so much good right now. And when we consciously practice gratitude, it becomes more than a response. It becomes a causative energy. What I think we all can sense, that what we stare at, what we focus on, what we think about all the time, is what we get more of in our lives. And so when we're practicing gratitude, what we're doing is focusing on the good we already have. And that means that we get more of it. We experience more of it. Compassion is simply respecting, respecting and honoring our true nature. We have compassion for ourselves and the true nature of everybody around us as, as places where this life, with a capital L, shows up and experiences itself and expresses itself. And, and we practice it through forgiveness and service to one another. And forgiveness is one of those things that, you know, I think is very difficult for us because we're trained in competition, not forgiveness. We're trained in, in one-upsmanship. But forgiveness is done for us. It has nothing to do with competition with anybody. It's a way we set ourselves free. We forgive in order to let go of that baggage of hurt and anger and resentment. And it doesn't mean we have to hang out with the person that we perceive as hurting us. It simply means we don't give them free rent in our minds anymore. You know, we let them go. We clear that space for something productive. And we go forward in, in the context and the awareness that we are spirit and everyone else is too, whether they're acting the way we think they ought to or not. It's all this life in expression. And we don't want to give some, some action that someone did in the past the continued opportunity to hurt us more. Sacred service is another way that we practice compassion because we're serving each other. We're serving our world with our talents and our love and our time, which reminds us that we are all in this together because we're all one, right? And then there's a whole group of practices that are about intentionally creating the life we want. Spiritual mind treatment, affirmative prayer is one, is the first one we think about. And inherent in that practice is affirmation. We affirm what it is we want to think, rather than simply allowing what comes up from our subconscious to be what we think. You know, the vast majority of our thoughts are habitual, and old, and tired, and probably not very useful. So what we have to do is, practice new ways of thinking until that becomes our habit. And affirmation is one of the ways we do that. And then our affirmation becomes the thing 
that our affirmative prayer centers around. There's the practice of giving and receiving. Giving and receiving is the practice of you know, participation in the flow of life. When we give, we generate the sense of gratefulness that we have enough to give and if the freedom to receive. Because receiving, I can't remember who it was that first said, you can't get out give the universe, right? We're being given to every moment of our lives, you know? We get oxygen for nothing. I mean, all we have to do is, we don't even have to think about it, you know? And it comes into our bodies and keeps us alive. You know, we have all this that's coming to us all the time. And we, when we receive it, it makes us grateful. And when we give it, it makes us grateful. And gratitude is, you know, the place to be if you want peace and joy and freedom. And then there's the thing that wraps it all up, which is sacred study. What we do on Sunday, what we do in our classes, what, what Marge Russell does in her class in the back. Um, she teaches affirmative prayer from 9 to 9.30, and then there's a discussion of, of what we of our philosophy, what we do in our small groups, what we do everywhere is sacred study of one sort or another. We read, you know, every Sunday we get, get seven little tidbits of wisdom on a topic from various spiritual sources. We... Um, we learn with each other, we practice to expand our knowledge and understanding of what science, mysticism, religion, and philosophy have told us for millennia, and then how we can put it to work in our lives today. So the invitation is to look at these spiritual practices and think about trying them to find the ones that work best for you. I don't know, I would be lost without my practices of sacred reading and contemplation and meditation and prayer. I don't know what I'd do. Um, and, I, I, and I wouldn't be lost, but I'm so much happier when I take that little gratitude journal out. There's some by each exit, by the way, it's 30 days of gratitude. And just remember on a daily basis what I have to be grateful for. I'm so much happier. And I ask my husband, I think I'm nicer too, right? I'm nicer when I'm grateful. <laughs> All of these spiritual practices remind us of who we are, truly and deeply. And they let us know ourselves so that we can be bold and courageous in living our lives, in being who we are and seeing the divine not only in ourselves, but in all those around us. The, the invitation is to try them so that you can discover the truth about who you are, so that, so that we together can chip away at the fear and the smallness and the powerlessness and the, the, the just general, uh, I don't know whether I want to do that, all those things we've learned that keep us in places maybe we don't want to be. When we start to learn to do that, then we move into the place where we are transformed. We are transformed as people. And, you know, I don't know, somebody said that it lets us lift, as Emma Curtis Hopkins said this, we lift our gaze and over the, over the arc of our vision, we see the higher truth. And we get a higher practice of it. And we are lifted, and we lift those around us into greater possibility. So I invite you to think about your own spiritual practice and how it can lead you to a greater and greater freedom. And, and my prayer for you is that your practice sets you free. Sets you free to be all that you came here to be.